As you've heard, I'm, I'm an engineer by training, and now I have the privilege to teach future engineers uh, that will go on to shape our world. And I guess in terms of what I wanted to get across to you today is some type of idea and inspiration as to the role that engineers have played in our humanity, in terms of our human development, uh, but also how they've shaped our world. Because I think, especially for everybody that grows up in a developed world like Canada, um, we take for granted some of the things that, uh, you know, make our lives so great. When you wake up in the morning and you have a clean glass of water to drink, a lot of that is due to some of the science and engineering that has gone into technologies to allow that to occur. When you go into your car or ride your bike or ride the bus again, there's a huge amount of engineering. And although you may not see the engineers that have created those things, their fingerprints are everywhere around us. So. Tomorrow or tonight when you go home, what I'd like you to do is, you know, as you're interacting with technology in whatever way it may be, think about the people who are behind that technology and what they've, um, they've given to us. So, you know, often when I talk, and I, I think uh, this is very true, that many people that aren't engineers themselves really don't know what an engineer does or what an engineer looks like or the kind of role that they do play. So I thought I'd start the talk with just what is an engineer and what do they do? So if you were to go to Google, which I'm sure many of us use as a way to gain information these days, and you said, if you typed in what is an engineer and what do they look like, this is what comes back. So this is kind of the world view of what engineers look like. Now what do you notice about those pictures? Is there anything that's striking about those pictures in terms of the way they look? Hard hats. They all, they're all dressed like construction workers. They're all dressed like construction workers. They're all wearing hard hats. What else about those pictures? They're all male. They're all male, yeah. So this is the world view of what engineers look like. This does not represent really the, the, the very significant role that engineers play in our world. So if you ask girls in grades four to six what they think engineers look like, and this came out of a Girl Guide Badge Day program we were running, because now as a Girl Guide, you can actually achieve an engineering badge. When I was growing up, as a Girl Guide, you could achieve a sewing badge, a cooking badge, uh, some outdoor skills badges, but not an engineering or a, a STEM badge, a science, technology, engineering math. And so these are the kind of pictures that, that came up. Do they look like the Google pictures a little bit? So even though these, gr these girls are gr you know, 10 to 12 years old, they may not have interacted with computers much, Yet, for some reason, this image of engineering has emerged in our popular culture. Um, many of these girls would have never met an engineer. They would have never taken engineering in school. They probably may have never heard much about engineering. Yet, the images they create are very strikingly similar to the images that the world seems to have about what engineers are and, and what they do. And, you know, when you look at the pictures, I've got a daughter who's 10, so she's in grade 4. And when we ask her to draw a picture, usually there's a big smile on their face and they're very colorful and stuff. And when I look at these pictures, they don't look very happy <laughs> in terms of what they're doing. It's very oriented in terms of, uh, you know, they're alone, they're not with other people. Um, it seems like, you know, the, the person in the coveralls, he's got, uh, you know, some tools in his hand. Again, the hard hat becomes very, very uh, strong imagery. So let's go into, you know, what is engineering versus science? Because all of you here would have taken science courses, but you may, you would have not probably taken any engineering courses. And so when we look at the difference between engineering and science, really engineering is the design of our human-made world, and it really deals with what can be. So if we were to imagine it as engineers, we can create it. When we contrast that with science, science is really the study of our natural world. And if you think about what what, what is going on there, it's the discovery of what is in our natural world. So that's really the big difference between science and engineering. So if you like finding out why things are the way they are, in terms of our natural world, then science is really the kind of uh, background that will give you that. Whereas if you like to be imaginative and think of, you know, what can we create, then that really falls into the realm of what engineering is. And again, this is just another kind of contrast. You know, science is more analysis-based, it's very discovery-based in terms of what is. You ask questions, you develop knowledge. In contrast, engineering is more of a synthesis. You integrate knowledge to create something new, often that does not exist now, or to improve something that does not exist. So really, the, the kind of end goal of science is to produce knowledge, whereas the end goal of engineering is to create something tangible. 
It could be a process, it could be a, pro uh, a, you know, a product or a thing. It becomes part of technology. And really, when you think about science, you know, and at the university, you know, you can study, you know, sort of pure sciences, you can study applied sciences. In engineering, it's more like an applied science or engineering. The characteristic activity is research, learning about nature, whereas engineering, the characteristic activity is creative design, design of a new process, design of a new product or technology. And I just wanted to make the point also that when we think about our interaction with technology or our interaction with humanity, with, with the, you know, engineering has been with us throughout humanity. And although they may not have been called engineers at the very, very beginning, and this is just one example of sort of, I guess what we've classified as one of the first known engineers. At the time, he was not called an engineer, but the kind of work he did was really engineering work. And that was in ancient Egypt, and uh, his name was... Imhotep, and if you go to the Louvre Museum in Paris, there's actually a little statue of him because he played such an important role in civilization at the time. And really, what you know, his major contribution was was he was one of the first people to design pyramids uh, with these steps in them. And he really is our first civil engineer that learns about structures and what kind of structures work and the interrelationship between strength, structure, and materials. And so. He was really one of the first, the first person really to integrate columns, which you can see in this middle, uh, middle uh, figure here, into structures to help provide strength in and stability for the structure to stand. And then there's just a kind of a, a you know, a, a representation of what he looked like. So that's really in the past. So it, again, the point is that engineering has been with us through, throughout time, from the ancient past through to today, and is definitely going to be with us in the future. And it has played a role in everything we do today. And in particular today, there is so much technology in our lives. And really, since the Industrial Revolution, it's exponential in terms of what we've been able to do as a humanity creatively to produce new technologies to help improve our lives. So when we think about engineering today, it's very, very diverse. In the, in, you know, in the ancient past, we may have had civil engineers because we were building simple structures. We might have had mechanical engineers in terms of movement or simple machines. But today, when we look at the breadth of engineering, it's truly amazing. You know, we can look at some of the more traditional ones, like electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and or we can think of um, the more specialized ones, like aerospace engineering, which looks at uh, flight, uh, maybe space travel, but um, you know, machines that can operate in the air to transport humans, to transport equipment, whatever it might be. We can think of uh, sort of dealing with our earth and you know, extracting usable materials from our earth that we may extract and process and then use to in our technology and our creations. And that may go into the realm of geological engineering, mining engineering, um, something called metallurgical engineering, where we look at ways to extract the useful materials from our earth. And these days I would say that, you know, as we think about what's going to happen into the future, there's now talk of mining, you know, into outer space, asteroid mining, to maybe bring back metals or other materials that are not, no, you know, not here on earth. So that's a very exciting, kind of far-reaching area, but I think will come to realization. We can think of chemical engineering, where we're dealing with chemical processes and products. Um, some of the materials would fall into that, some of the plastics we would use, uh, because many of the synthetic uh, plastics we use are kind of carbon-based or oil-based. We can think of, you know, when we think of the, the, the kinds of machines we use today, many of them are no longer a purely mechanical device, but they have an integration of computers and software into them, and so they're what we call a mechatronic device. So again, if we think of the cars we may use, it's not just a mechanical device anymore. There's all sorts of software embedded in it. A camera that we might use, again, all sorts of software. And if we think about the very, very small now, we've developed characterization and manufacturing ways to produce things on an atomic level. So we can design things atom by atom to a more macro level, and that falls into the realm of nanotechnology. And I think that's actually what Caitlin's plan to study at the University of Waterloo, so we're really excited to have her there. And then when we think about our own health, there's been the emergence of an area called biomedical engineering, which is looking at the integration of technology into our bodies. So if you've got to replace a knee, a hip, um, you know, maybe a, a, an artificial eye or something like that, there's been all sorts of integration of engineering into our bodies. 
and also into the procedures that you may do. So that now when you're doing open heart surgery, it's often a robot that's assisting you in doing that. When we think now about engineering into the future, you know, when we, when we ponder the challenges our world faces and our humanity faces, there's lots and lots of opportunity and need for science and engineering to play a role in terms of the solutions. So again, if we just think about environmental stability, climate change, these are all major challenges, I would say, but I don't want people to lose hope because we're very ingenious as a humanity and I think that we can come up with solutions for these, whether it be looking at alternative forms of energy that aren't oil-based and gas-based, um, you know, solar power, wind power, tidal power. There's all sorts of research going on now to find ways to make those economical and viable sources to give us uh, energy that is renewable. We can think of waste management now so that our waste becomes a source of energy instead of a source of waste. And can we somehow bring all the waste we produce back into our energy chain to either create, create energy or reuse some of those products in a different way. And again, we can think of renewable resources. Another topic is healthcare. Where does engineering in the future go with healthcare? Again, we're at a point now where they're starting to print and produce or manufacture artificial organs. Um, for people that might have heart failure or other parts of the body internally that might have failed. And so we're now in a situation where through technology we can actually produce some artificial organs. Um, they're doing things where they're printing, 3D printing or additive manufacturing of tissues. And another big issue still worldwide is affordable medication. Uh, so, you know, if you think about developing countries where, you know, malaria still may be a big issue. There's a Zeta virus going on in Brazil now. How can we develop the technology for the medication, but also make it affordable in terms of a fairness in the world. And then finally, the third example I'm giving is transportation. When we think now of how uh, we move ourselves, and when we think about how that's evolved in humanity, you know, initially we were walking, and so you could only go so, uh, so far a distance and, and at such a speed. And when we think how that has evolved, you know, we've gone to now being able to travel at hundreds and hundreds of kilometers uh, per hour in planes and stuff. And when we think about the future, I definitely think autonomous vehicles is on the near horizon. And, you know, some of the cars now, like some of the Teslas and stuff, you are able to have these autonomous vehicles. It creates huge uh, questions around uh, ethical behavior of the cars, I guess, in terms of do you, do you run over the dog or do you swerve to avoid the dog and potentially hurt the humans inside? How do you make all these decisions? So embedded in the use of this technology will be lots of ethical um, and philosophical questions around what is right and what is wrong. And I think there's lots of opportunity to contribute to that discussion and we all should contribute to that discussion. It's quite an important one to have. Um, there's space travel. I think there's lots of interesting things and your generation may be the first generation that starts to more routinely go into space if that was something that you wanted to do. And then for those of you that like Elon Musk and Tesla and, and SpaceX, his idea is around the Hyperloop now. In Toronto, they've formed a corporation that is actually looking at, you know, and has put a challenge out to the world to come up with a kind of a prototype of what a Hyperloop rapid transit system might look like. And we're looking at now travel, really diminishing our travel time so that, you know, a trip from Toronto to Vancouver, Maine could occur in three hours. So huge changes in terms of what's going on, in terms of the role that engineering will play in our lives and the way that we all can contribute to how our lives change and to help everyone's lives in the world. So I just, you know, I sort of wanted to end it with a quote from Charles Vest. And Charles Vest was the former president of MIT. He was an engineer himself. He actually became the, uh, the president of the National Engineering Academy in the States. But really, he went on to say just a few years ago that he envied your generation, the next generation of engineering students, because this is one of the most exciting periods in human history for science and engineering in terms of both the challenges that face us, but also the opportunities we have to really make a difference in the world. So, um, so I, I thought that was very inspirational. And finally, if I have a little bit of time, and maybe I don't. No, I don't. So I'm going to leave it. I had one video to show you, but I think I'll leave it. If there's time at the break, I'll show you. It was a video we recently put together. We just kind of launched it this week. And we had talked to kids around contrasting professions in terms of, you know, what does a teacher look like? What does a police officer do? And also profile some engineer, engineers to see what they actually do. So thank you very much for your attention.